So let me invite you to open up a Bible, if you have it, to Psalm 130. Uh, that's the text on which uh, this morning's uh, teaching is going to be based, and that's the, the sermon reading. If you don't have a Bible with you and you want to use one of the ones that's in the, uh, the chair racks uh, in front of you, that would be the blue volume. The red is the hymnal. The blue would be the, the Bible. And you can fi- find Psalm 130 on page 658. So if you're, if you're physically able, let me invite you to stand as I read this. And when I am finished, I'm going to make the declaration that this is the word of the Lord and invite you to respond by saying, thanks be to God. This is Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope, my soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. So more than a hundred years ago, in 1916, Uh, A small Presbyterian at the time, Presbyterian College, Cumberland College, reluctantly made the decision to play a college football game against Georgia Tech, a team that was coached by the legendary John Heisman. Like John Heisman, yes, that, that Heisman, the one after which the Heisman Trophy is named, the award that's given every year to the uh, the, the best college football player, that John Heisman was the coach of Georgia Tech. Now, interestingly, you might never have known this, but, but Cumberland College had been, just a few years earlier, a southern powerhouse in college football. They had been a very good team. But by this point, they were terrible. And they were awful. And the school was on the verge of financial collapse. And so they made the hard decision to cut the, cut the football program. And several weeks before the game against Georgia Tech, Cumberland notified them that they, they weren't going to be able to play the game. I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to play. The problem is Coach Heisman of Georgia Tech wanted, wanted nothing. To, he didn't want to hear anything about it. And he reminded Cumberland of the contract that they had made to play the game, a contract that, if broken, would mean that Cumberland would have to pay Georgia Tech a $3,000 forfeit fee. It's about $70,000 today. It doesn't seem like a ton, but Cumberland was bankrupt. And they tried to find a loophole anywhere in the contract, but it was, it, was, it was airtight. And they didn't have the money to pay the fee, so they had to play. So they gathered 13 players, most of them fraternity brothers of the team's student manager. And everyone expected it to be a blowout, but no one expected what ended up happening. Cumberland got, got the ball first. They, 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 they received the, the, the initial kickoff, but Georgia Tech forced them to punt, and then on the first play, they ran for a 30-yard touchdown, 7-0. Cumberland got the ball back. They fumbled immediately on the first play. Georgia Tech picked it up, ran for a touchdown, 14-0. Cumberland fumbled on the first play of the next possession, leading to another touchdown, 21-0. At the end of the first quarter, it was 63-0. Now, if you're experiencing the summer slide and and having trouble doing mental math, that's nine touchdowns, 63 divided by seven. Nine touchdowns in the first quarter. And then Georgia Tech scored nine more in the second quarter. Now, high blowout scores were actually, actually quite common those days, but this was setting a new standard. And usually... The coach of the team that's, that's, that's blowing the other team out will, will you know, dial things back a little bit, put in the second string players, you know, start playing people in different positions, have everyone running backwards, something, anything, to just show a little bit of mercy. But that wasn't Coach Heisman's approach. In fact, at halftime, he told the Georgia Tech team, he said, all right, you're doing all right, guys. He said, but you never know what those Cumberland players may have up their sleeve. They may, they may still spring a surprise. There wasn't any surprise coming. They did agree, Georgia Tech did agree to shorten the time of the second half, but the pace of their scoring continued, and the final score was 222 to nothing. The most lopsided game in all of college football history, and one of the clearest examples of showing no mercy (laughs) 
that, that, that we've ever seen in sports. In Psalm 130, we have a song that shows us a desperate need for mercy. And we see God's response to it, a response to that need. It's a short psalm. And the, the, the overall message is actually relatively easy to see. The, the, what it's saying is relatively easy to see. God's people are to, are to recognize that the only certain hope for their rescue, the only hope that they have, comes from the Lord of mercy. We need mercy, and our only hope comes from God. That's the essential kind of message of the psalm, but we have to break it down a little bit. We've got to say a little bit more about it, because that seems on the face of it, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we just gloss over that, of course. We need mercy. God provides mercy. End of story. But we don't really think about that, and we should. Most of your Bibles um, will show a uh, kind of breaks between each of the two verses, it's sort of divided up that way, verses 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 5 and 6, 7 and 8, and those verse breaks that are there, they provide, I think, as good as any guide for sort of following the thread here, so, so roughly in line with those four verse pairs that we see in Psalm 130. Let's look at what we, uh, what we just read under four different headings, right? First, a plea for mercy. Second, the truth of mercy. Third, the assurance of mercy. And fourth, the proclamation of mercy. Okay? A plea, the truth, the assurance, and the proclamation. Now, first, a plea, a plea for mercy. Now, we don't, we don't know for sure who's writing this psalm, but we can figure out a bit of the context from, from what we see. Look at verse 1. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. All right, so first thing we sense is, is, is despair. The cry of this person is out of the depths. And by depths, what is always meant in poetic metaphor like this is usually the, the image of the sea, right? The, the feeling of helplessness and terror that comes as, as if you're in a dark sea all alone. A, a friend of uh, one of my children, they play on the same baseball team, had a birthday party uh, on Monday night where the whole team and the parents were invited on a four-hour fishing charter. And we left out of Point Pleasant. We went about six or seven miles out into the Atlantic, and we fished uh, for, sea, for sea bass with the, with, with the kids. And now, if you remember Monday, it was an absolutely perfect day. Right? Bright sunshine, very little wind, very calm seas. Skies were so clear you could still see the coastline, uh, the, the coastline faintly in the, in the distance. So, so not much to fear, really. Perfect conditions. Decent-sized boat, experienced crew, modern navigation, we passed the Coast Guard cutters on our way out of the harbor, right? I mean, like, there's relatively little to, to fear. And yet, when we stopped and, dro- and, and dropped anchor out in the middle of the sea, seven miles off the coast, I looked around at the vastness of the ocean, and even with almost no threat whatsoever, couldn't help for a minute to think what it must be like to be out there in the middle of the night where the seas were not so calm. Or, or, or what it, and this is where my mind went, or what it must have been like for my seasick grandfather when he was crossing the Atlantic on a boat worried not just about like being out in the middle of the ocean but whether there was a German U-boat out there ready to sink the troop carrier right or what something someone like uh, you know the former Olympic uh, runner Louis Zamperini must have felt on a lifeboat for days after he had been shot down in the Pacific in 1943 right that's a sense of the image here out of the depths I call to you. That, it's that kind of despair and terror. And you don't, have, you don't have to be on a boat to be able to relate to it. Because people who suffer or people who have experienced a sense of real clinical depression will often use that image of drowning when they're speaking. Even if they've never had any experience with physical drowning, they'll say, I feel like I'm drowning. That's what it feels like. That's the despair that's, that's, that's here. That's the depths that it's that it's, that it's talking about, this overwhelmed feeling uh, as, as, if, as if things are just closing in around you, as if the waters are just swallowing you up. And you get to the point where, where you just feel like you're done. I'm just done. I'm finished with this. A- at one point during that blowout, that, that Georgia Tech blowout of Cumberland College in 1916, one of the Cumberland players snuck around to the other side, to the Georgia Tech bench, and, and buried his head under a blanket. And, and the Georgia Tech assistant coach said to him, um, say, you're on the wrong, bun- you're on the wrong bench, son. <laughs> you're on the wrong side. And the player said, yeah, I, I, I know, but please don't tell anybody because if I sit over here, I won't have to go back in the game. <laughs> right? That, have you ever felt like that? I'm just done, I'm just done with the game. 
right? Please don't put me back in the game. That's the plea for mercy. Now, there's an element of hope, though, in this plea that we have to see. The plea for mercy is not just something that is completely desperate on the part, because to whom is it addressed? We'll come back to this in a few minutes, but there is a recognition at the outset that it matters to whom you cry, to whom you express your plea, because the writer isn't crying to himself. Did you see that? Self-help is not the answer, and that's pretty apparent to most anyone who truly feels the weight of despair because they realize that they're at the end of themselves. There's nothing that they can do to help themselves. So you don't cry to yourself. You cry, if you can cry to anyone, to someone who you think can actually rescue you. And that's what the psalmist is doing. He cries to you, O Lord. And that sentiment continues into verse 2. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas. So rescue is needed, but from whom? From what? And this is very important. Right? Look, the end of verse 2. The pleas that this person is making, the pleas, for, the, the pleas that they're making are for mercy, which helps us classify the psalm correctly because that's, what's, that's the threat here. Right? From what or whom is rescue being sought? It's not an external threat. It's not an enemy army, a political enemy, a people who are oppressing the people of God. We talked about that a little bit last week if you were, if you were here. There are psalms that are like that, that look out at, at external oppression. That's not the driving sense of despair here, though. There are other psalms that deal with persecution, with illness, with general anxiety. This isn't one of them. This is is one of six or seven penitential psalms, they're called. Penitential psalms. Psalms of repentance that seek rescue from sin, or to use the word of verse 3, from iniquity. So that's the plea. It's a plea for what? It's a plea for mercy. That's heading number one. Now, move to heading number two, the truth of mercy. And here's where, we, here's where we tackle the underlying problem that many people would have with the premise of a plea for mercy. All right, follow me here. It, see, if, if mercy is required, then guilt is implied. Right? Responsibilities have not been met, and there's consequences that would, that would then follow. And the psalmist starts to rehearse some truth about the need for mercy. Look at verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? What's he saying? Well, the first thing he seems to recognize is, is a fear of a God who would mark iniquities. And of course, there is a God who would mark iniquities. I mean, he's asking it as a rhetorical question, and he's recognizing that there's a problem here. God, if you should mark iniquities, who could stand? But of course, the very plea for mercy implies that, that there actually is a God that is marking iniquities, right? In the sense of this word mark is to write something down as in a as in a record book. What would that mean? Right? Why, would, why, would, why would that be such a big... Why do people rebel against that? And here's where many people see the whole problem with the, with the Bible. They say, look, there you go again, talking about guilt. All you're doing is giving people a poor self-image. We need, to, we need to get rid of this whole concept of guilt. Guilt is the problem. The sense of being marked and compared to a, to a, to a standard. And it doesn't take an extensive search to find this kind of thinking. For example, I just did, just to test it out, I did a quick Google search of the term eliminating guilt. I just wrote eliminating guilt, Google, right? And right at the top of the list was this article, Ways to Get Rid of Guilt. Very interesting. I wanted to know, so I clicked on it. First item on the list. <clears throat> First item on the list, don't should yourself. That's what it says. Don't should yourself. In other words, stop judging yourself. Get rid of the shoulds. Forget about any shoulds because you should focus... Because when you focus on being critical of yourself, quote, you are limiting your potential to grow. That's the first suggestion. Don't should yourself. Second suggestion, practice positive affirmations. For example, the author says, you should write yourself a note each day that says something like this, quote, I am healthy and prosperous, and I am accepting of all abundant things coming into my life. Okay. Now, combined with the first suggestion, don't should yourself. Second, second suggestion, practice positive affirmations. What's that mean? You basically have a prescription for the elimination of guilt that says replace the rigid external standards of shoulds with your own personal standards, which initially kind of says like, okay, well, that's, I mean, that sounds good, until you really actually think about it. Because now listen, religious people among us, if there's any of you religious people, right? Be careful not to laugh too much and have too much fun with this. Have a bit of compassion because someone who actually puts themselves in the position has a number of problems that they have to deal with, 
Right? First, we think that eliminating a rigid standard of, uh, of, of, of justice, right? eliminating the idea of iniquity, we think that if we could just get rid of that, we would feel better about ourselves. That it would be therapeutic if we just got rid of a, you know, some sort of extra, external standard. But is that, is that true? Is that actually what has happened around us as we remove external standards? Do people generally feel better about themselves? Not really. Any less misery? Any less psychological issues? Any less depression in the, in the world, even though we've got much more of this than we ever had before? No, we still feel inadequate. Still feel like we don't measure up. Still feel guilty. We don't know why, but we still feel guilty that we failed to meet some kind of standard. But instead of a fixed standard of a perfect God that never moves, we replace it with a standard that is either other people, right, or, as the article said, a standard of our own aspirations. But that is not comforting when you really think about it. In fact, when we replace it with our own aspirations, we feel more guilty, not less. Right? That's where social media is, is, is killing us. You see, you see the perfect you see the, the perfectly curated life of that, that other family. There's always, there's always another family. You see that perfectly curated life, and you, and you look at your own, and you think about it, and you sink. You sink deeper into the depths. Right? Or, or, or forget about the other people comparisons, your own aspirations. Just measure by your own desires, your own dreams. Your standard is what you can imagine and what you can dream. Look, I, lo- I love Disney movies in so many ways, but this is at the root of many Disney movies, almost all of them. Right? Make a wish, dream your dreams, envision your prince, your own aspirations. Quote, this is one of the most famous songs, right? Have faith in your dreams and someday your rainbow will come smiling through. No matter how your heart is grieving, if you keep on believing, that dream that you wish will come true. Summer Olympics finished up early this morning, I think, right, in Tokyo. And they always interview the medal winners. And they often say things like, I just kept on believing. Right? Just kept on working hard, and now my dream came true. But what about the ones who finished fourth and fifth? You ever wonder about that? The ones who finished way last, they probably never had any dream of, of actually winning. They were the glad to be there people. But the ones who finished fourth and fifth, right? They had a dream, right? They worked just as hard. Right? Did they work hard too? I'm not saying we shouldn't have goals. I'm not saying we shouldn't work hard. But I'm saying you need to recognize this. Your own dreams are a far harsher taskmaster than God is sometimes. You'll either be forced to lower them or you'll dream and you'll dream and you'll dream that something really will come true and then it doesn't. And you'll sink deeper, deeper into the depths. So there is a perfect standard and we need it. It's a good thing. But second problem Right? If you completely eliminate any possibility of knowing whether you should, uh, uh, any, any, any possibility of an external standard, of an idea of iniquity and justice, if you do that, you'll never be able to know whether you should feel guilty about something or not. But there are things that we should feel guilty about and things that we ought not to feel guilty about, but you'll never know unless you have a perfect standard. If the standard is just left to us, then it'll always be shifting. How do you know whether you should feel guilty about something or not? All right, for example, we lump all guilt together, but there are things for which we should not feel guilty, right? Because it, because it, really, isn't, it really isn't something wrong that we've done or, it is, or it's something that's outside of our control, right? If you finish fourth in the Olympic event and you've worked as hard as you possibly can, should they, should they feel guilty for failing, for not getting a medal? Probably not. A lot of life is like that. Guilt for things that are outside our responsibility, but that's not everything. For example, right, if you're the, it, the Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin... I was just thinking about this. In the, er, in the early 1930s, with brutal intentionality, created policies that ended up starving to death about 13% of the population of Ukraine. About 3.9 million people. Now, if he had woken up one morning and asked one of his advisors, you know, I'm feeling a little bit guilty about this. You think I should feel guilty? What's the right answer? Would the, would, what would the, well, I mean, if the advisor had answered the way he should have advised, he wouldn't have been an advisor very long. But, but, ima- but, but what, how, how should the advisor have answered have answered. Should he have just said should? Should. Should you feel guilty? Joseph, you've got, you've got to get rid of the shoulds. Right, they're limiting your potential here. Right, you have a wish, to, a wish your heart made to feed Russians by starving Ukrainians. That's your wish. Have faith in your dream, Joseph. You see the point? Without a standard, without a perfect standard to judge whether something is iniquity, you'll never have a basis for knowing whether you should feel guilty about something or not. But if your guilt is true guilt, 
Here's the, here's the real problem that this brings up. If your guilt is real guilt, well, then, then, then who could stand? <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's, that's what the psalmist says in verse 3. Who could stand? That is the right question, and that is the real problem. All right? That's when you need the other truth about mercy to which the psalmist is clinging in verse 4, and that is that this mercy is available. Forgiveness is available. With you, he says, there is forgiveness. With whom? With whom? With yourself? No, with the Lord. And verse 4 is not, it's not phrased like a wish. It's a statement. It's a statement, of, it's a statement of fact. Mercy is central to God's character. It's what, Israel, it's what Israel had been told, and it's what Israel had experienced over and over again. Right? They had been told this very clearly. When Moses asked God to reveal himself to him, Moses said, God, reveal yourself to me. I want to I see your glory, right, in chapter, Exodus chapter 34. Remember what God said? How he started his classic self-identification of himself? He said about himself, get this, he said, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And that's what God said about himself, that he's a God of mercy. And that's exactly what Israel had experienced over and over again. When they build a golden calf, when they complained in the desert, when they repeatedly disobeyed the Lord, over and over again, God continued to be patient with his people. Even in his discipline, he was merciful. Why? Because if he had just let them, let them alone to what they had deserved, right? That, that would have no mercy there. No, the discipline, the corrective discipline was, was merciful, showing them that they had gone off track. God is a God of mercy. In him, there is forgiveness. But there's still the whole question of how. All right, so the, let's move to the third heading then. Right, we've got a, we have a plea. We have truth about that mercy, Right? That, that we need it and that it is available with the Lord. But now, how do we have any kind of assurance of it? And, we, and here we can really combine some things here because we find our assurance really in, in both of these last two couplets in these last four verses, five, six, seven, and eight. We see, it in, we see it in all of them. Or at least we can see in these verses how it leads us to an assurance that the psalmist had but that we have now even more reason to have. Look at verses seven and eight. <clears throat> Verse seven. Hope in the Lord. Now again, we have to understand what biblical hope, when it speaks of biblical hope, is not wishing. There is a difference. It's, it, wishing is often uncertain. I hope it happens, we say. But that's not hope when we talk about hope from a biblical perspective. All right, hope from a biblical perspective is a certain expectation that something that has not yet happened or happened fully will happen. And again, right, it is grounded in God's character. For with the Lord, it says, with the Lord, there is steadfast love and there is plentiful redemption. Steadfast love. God is love, and it is expressed in his faithfulness to a covenant to rescue and to preserve a people for himself. That's what he had promised. He remains steadfast to that covenant. And that's what he'll do, verse 8. Not only, not only is there redemption with him, our only hope of redemption is in him. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities, which with, you know, just look at that verse, verse 7. He will redeem Israel, or verse 8, he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And, and this is a very nice sort of literary inclusio with, with verse 3. It's a device that kind of circles back to something earlier to kind of bring it to, to resolution. Because in verse 3, there's a recognition that if the iniquities were marked by God, we would be hopeless, we couldn't stand. But in verse 8, we see how the iniquities are handled. We're redeemed from them. There are iniquities, God, in a sense, marks them, but in a sense, in another sense, in a very real sense, he doesn't mark them against us. Now, how could that be true? And just a second on this word redeemed here, because this is really where we begin to see it. In some cases, like in the sense where we referred to it last week, redeem in the Bible carries the idea of paying a ransom, an exchange kind of kind of happening, a very specific kind of redemption where money is paid, a ransom is paid in order to buy someone out of slavery or something like that. And that is a gloriously true statement for what God does for us. But many times, and this is one of them, when the word is used, the word redeem is really meant in a more general kind of sense. It just simply means to rescue, to save, to protect. And, and, and from the context here, it's that more general idea of rescue that's in view. But what's important is, who does the redeeming? Who's the subject of this sentence? God is. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. 
He will provide mercy. He will remove the guilt. He will forgive. But again, how's the marking happen? He sort of marks. He knows our, he knows our iniquity, but he doesn't mark them against us. Against whom? We don't forgive ourselves, but we wait for something better. Verses 5 and 6, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope, my soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than the watchmen. Very important. In two senses, two senses it's very important. First, picture a watchman on an ancient city wall, right? The watchman. There's lots of things that a watchman would probably be watching for in the middle of the night, an enemy approaching under the cover of darkness, any disturbance in the city, a fire perhaps, something that would threaten the city, right? Those things, those things though, may or may not happen, right? Maybe an enemy coming, but maybe not, right? Maybe a fire or some sort of disturbance in the city, but maybe not. But watching for the morning, when the watchman is watching for the morning, is that going to happen? Yes, it is. <laughs> it's going to come. Any maybe about whether the morning's going to come or not? Nope. It's coming. When the watchman waits for the morning, he knows it's coming. It's a certainty. Waiting for the Lord's rescue is like that. There is a certainty to it. But there's also this. Why would the watchman be waiting for the morning? Is it just, because, just simply because it's the end of the shift, quitting time? Right? Or, or is, he just, just, is he just simply a human alarm clock like the rooster crowing? Charles Spurgeon loved the, uh, the commentaries of a relatively obscure theologian named Robert Nisbet. Uh, he wrote a, a commentary on the Psalms of Ascent. And, and Nisbet observes that the watchman would also be looking to the, to the east right, for the morning for the first red streak over Moab's mountains that gave intimation of the approaching day, the watchmen would be looking for the morning. Why? Because they were waiting for the accustomed hour when the morning sacrifice could be offered. When the soul could be relieved of the burden of its sorrow and sin and could draw that strength from renewed intercourse with heaven. Why would, they, why, why would you watch for the morning? so that you could start the day through the, through the morning sacrifice with a renewed strength, a renewed intercourse, a renewed relationship with the God of heaven. At the break of day, the morning sacrifice offered in the temple provided the reminder of God's provision for sin. That yes, sin was marked, but in a symbolic way then, marked against a sacrifice, so that intercourse with heaven, relationship with God could happen. That's what Israel was waiting for, waiting, waiting, like a watchman for the morning, waiting all the way until an 84-year-old widow named Anna was standing in the temple centuries later. It says in Luke's gospel that she worshiped and she fasted in the temple day and night. Why? She was waiting. She was waiting like a watchman for the morning. And then the baby Jesus is brought one morning to the temple by his parents, presented along with a sacrifice to the Lord, a rite of redemption according to the Mosaic law that was the requirement for every firstborn son in Israel. And Anna sees this baby Jesus that morning, and it says, Luke 2.38, that she began to give thanks to God and speak to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Everyone, she says, are you waiting? Have you been waiting for the one against whom iniquity can be marked so that it isn't you? He's here. The redemption of Jerusalem is here. They have been waiting, and finally, the Redeemer had arrived. The one who would fulfill Psalm 130's certain promise that the Lord will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And now like Hannah, now there is news to share. If you could mark iniquity, who could stand? No one. No one. None of us. But if Jesus becomes the mark of that iniquity, if He takes, if he takes the blame, if He assumes the consequences of the guilt, the guilt wasn't His inherently. He didn't commit the iniquity. But if He assumes the consequences of it, then we can stand. 
and then we proclaim it. Final point. Last short story. 1830. In 1830, a date was set in the British West Indian colonies for the slaves of those islands to be freed. It was to be August 1st. That's just a week ago this Sunday. August 1st was the date set for the slaves of the British West Indies to be freed. And many thousands of them, as you might expect, many thousands of them never went to bed at all the night of July 31st. It it says in the account that I was reading that they assembled in their places of worship, singing praises to God and waiting, quote, for the first streak of the light of the morning of that day on which they were to be made free. In fact, some of them, the writer of this account in 1872, some of them were sent up to the hills, up to the hills, to the highest point they could find, from which they might be able to obtain, he says, the first view of the coming day. I want to see it first. And then to be able to signal to their brothers in the, in the valley, quote, the dawn of the day that was to make them men. And no longer as they had hitherto been mere goods and chattels. Men with souls that God created to live forever. How eagerly these men must have watched for the morning. And then they shouted to their brothers in the valley. To their brothers in the depths. The morning has come and we are free. They shouted like verse 7, O Israel, hear the news. That's where the psalm shifts from prayer to proclamation. Do you see? It's no longer prayer when it comes to verse 7. It's proclamation. O Israel, tell the news. Now for the ancient Israelites, news that that redemption will happen. For you and me, O Israel, News that that redemption has happened. We are free, men and women. The morning has arrived. The sacrifice for sin has been made fully, finally, iniquity forgiven, guilt removed, justice paid, joy restored, freedom at last. Let's pray. Father, we don't deserve a bit of your mercy, but it is amazingly given. Given to us who are in the depths if we understand ourselves rightly. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of the one who would come to redeem us. And thank you for the fulfillment of that promise through the Lord Jesus Christ. King, our Savior, the one in whose name we pray. Amen.